So welcome everyone. Welcome to the New England Hymns Spring Event. My name is Scott Bradley and I've had the privilege of serving over this past year as the chapter president. And I'd like to just make a few remarks and then turn it over to, uh, to our speakers for today. We have a, a wonderful program lined up and I'm really excited to, uh, to hear what, what our speakers have to say. Before I do that, I'd just like to make a few announcements. And if somebody wouldn't mind running out to the parking lot and grabbing everyone who's tailgating out there and let them know we're, we're starting, I'd appreciate that. Um, great news, it's, uh, it's one of those sort of nice problems to have, but we sold out this event. Um, we sold out the event three weeks ago. So we will, uh, we'll, we will certainly expand the, uh, the size of, the, of uh, the venue in the future, but uh, it's great. We're, we're at 200, 200 people registered and uh, um, really good turnout to, to hear. Um, welcome to all of you who've come from across New England. Um, this year's theme has been, um, has been innovation. We have a lineup of uh, some really exciting stuff for you today, including a, um, a pitch-a-thon which is, uh, I think, the first pitch-a-thon that we've done in New England Hymns. I'd also like to point out we have um, each of you grabbed one of these blue cards when you came in, and um, each of our sponsors is listed here. Please uh, um, spend a little bit of time walking around to each of the tables in the back of the room and, and around the sides. Um, once you get each of these uh, stamped, at 3.30 we'll be doing a drawing. You can turn in the card um, ahead of 3.30. Um, once you have everything marked off here. So we'd just like to uh, say a special thank you to the wonderful sponsorship that we've had at New England Hymns. Uh, thanks to all the sponsors who are here today and who have been supporting us. Without your support, we, we could not hold events like this for everyone. So thank you. So with that, um, just like to make a few comments on the, the theme for this year, which is innovation. Innovation uh, is is really alive and strong in, in healthcare IT, and, and we've really lived and, and experienced it um, dramatically in, in the recent past. And so this year, our focus was let's try to um, let's try to bring in some some new themes, some new ideas, and really um, push some of the boundaries. And uh, and that's what uh, that's what we have on the agenda for you today. Um, during the day, please keep an eye on, on Twitter. We'll be tweeting um, updates on the event with uh, the hashtag uh, NEHIMS. And also check us out on, on LinkedIn. We've been very active there. And, um, and that's it. At this point, I'd, I'd like to, um, I'd, I would like to introduce our host for this morning's breakfast. How many of you um, grabbed something to eat when you came in this morning? All right, special thanks to, to Northeastern University. And I'd like to introduce Jay Spitolnik. Thank you, Scott. I have three minutes, so I'm going to talk fast. First of all, it was great to see all of our former and current students, former and current faculty, including Scott here today. A couple of people who are here with me who I want to introduce, if they could stand up, Karen Rosen and Katie McCune, who are from our cooperative education program. We're, we're here today for two reasons. One is that we would like you to know about our program so that you can, if you've got potential students, you can refer them to us. But also if you have situations that, uh, that, that would warrant bringing in co-ops or interns or people working on capstone projects, we'd like to talk to you about that too. So Karen, Katie, and I will be around through the, the day to talk to you. There are a couple of things that I specifically wanted to mention today, and that is that our program is evolving as, as our profession is evolving. One way is that within the MS and in Health Informatics program, we are, we are expanding what we do in terms of analytics so that there's more analytics involved. But we're also very excited to announce that this fall we're going to be launching a brand new MS and Health Data Analytics program. There is information on your tables both about the overall health informatics program and about the health data informatics program. We also have some things back at the table next to the Logicalis folks in the back of the room. So as I said, Katie, Karen, and I will be here through the day to talk to you. We're very happy that, uh, to start you off on a full stomach. So enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. 
And before I turn the microphone over to our morning keynote, I would, um, I would like to recognize the members of the New England Hymns Board. If you are a, a board member of New England Hymns, please stand up. And thank you so much for all of your work for this event and everything else that we've done. And with that, I would like to have, ask Ethan Fenner from InterSystems to introduce our morning keynote. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, everyone, for coming this morning. My name is Ethan Fenner from InterSystems Corporation. If you've never heard of InterSystems, that's okay. We are a technology company. We are not a marketing company. It may be a bit of a surprise to know that hundreds upon hundreds of companies deliver health information technology, their products on top of InterSystems. Epic is uh, probably the most notable. Um, which can be a surprise to some people. Also, Quest Diagnostic, um, LabCorp, um, really lab results in, a, across the nation are, uh, are all thriving on InterSystems technology. And <clears throat> this is our first real sponsorship here for New England Hymns, so it's a pleasure for me to be here. Absolutely. Um, I had the privilege of working with Joe Cavader at Partners Healthcare for many years. If you look at the little bio there, it says, he is creating a new model of healthcare delivery. That is not an overstatement. Uh, Joe began telemedicine at Mass General Hospital in 1995. So it's 21 years later, the Center for Connected Health at Partners Healthcare, he, he and his team really have been moving the needle and creating a new method of care delivery. Uh, so it is a pleasure for me and an honor to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Joe Caveda. Please join me. So by 2020, there will be 20 billion everyday objects that we now think of as inanimate and dumb, if you will, which will be now smart because they will be connected through what you already are seeing, but an onslaught of cheap sensors connected to mobile devices in the cloud. And that, of course, is what everyone calls the Internet of Things. And a couple of years ago, I was pondering that change in the context of a fire drill. Uh, <laughs> but really, it, it, it seemed to me quite profound. And, and, and I had to ask myself, will that affect the way we deliver care in 2020? And surely it will. Surely it will. So at that point, I was inspired to work on this Good book. Good morning, Joe. Here's the tale of the tape. Your blood. I'm going to go back on that because that uh, that was a mistake here. Hold on. All right. Very interesting. Good. There we are. Okay, pretend that never happened. <laughs> so I was inspired to work on this book uh, with co-authors, co my co-authors Carol Coleman and Gina Cella, and we're going to be uh, signing books uh, after the panel after this. The, the notion behind the book is really several things, but one of them is to try to point out some areas where innovation is needed for us to take advantage of all of the new data 
that these things in the Internet of Things are bringing that will indeed affect the way we deliver care. And was I, as I thought about that, I really uh, broke it down into three areas where I'm going to spend the majority of my time with you talking about those three areas where there's already some glimmer of what we might see in a few years, but lots of innovation needed. And then in each case, a couple of companies that are doing a good job in the space. But before I get to that, I want to take you into my future for about five years. I guess 2020 is now four years in. And talk to you about a new healthcare benefit that my employer is offering. I've just signed up for it. And it involves a virtual coach. Now the idea is that I'm making a trade-off here. And if we, if and when we do q and I'm sure there will be questions about this, but the trade-off is that I've given up enormous amounts of my private information, all wearables data, all data off my mobile device, to enable this virtual coach to motivate me to a more healthy state. Partners has this offering, again in five years, because they already know that if I stick to that plan, I will be healthier, I'll cost them less money and therefore they've given me a premium discount. So I just want to set up that there's that tug, tug in, uh, 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 between privacy and reward which we now see so often in the marketplace and really in the sales and marketing part of the industry will come into healthcare. The second thing I want to say before I set this up is that this uh, coach that you see, you'll, you'll meet him in a minute, Sam, uh, is really designed to motivate me and I am very responsive to an authoritative coaching voice that's just the way I'm built and you'll see that's very much how Sam is some people find that future offensive or even worrisome and I just remind them that just think about having this persona coaching you in a way that motivates you whether that's in in involving you in competitions or involving you in uh, some incentive structure or what have you. You all know the but what pushes your buttons and this is built around what pushes my buttons. So let me take you again five years into the future. It's uh, the fall uh, uh, or rather the spring of 2021 I guess now and I'm getting up in the morning and as you already saw by mistake the first thing I get is a message from Sam. Good morning, Joe. Here's the tale of the tape. Your blood pressure and cholesterol are fine. Your sleep deficit is now up to three hours for the week. You've put on two pounds since last month, and your activity level is falling short of your goal by 25%. You need more sleep, and you need more exercise if you're going to get into that size 40 tuxedo for Julie's wedding in March. 140 days to go and counting. Get moving, pal. So you see what I mean, right? That's how Sam, now Sam's really helping me make choices, right? So I don't want to end up looking like this from my daughter's wedding, but rather more Bond-like, like, uh, like that. And that's gonna take some effort on my part. Now, uh, all of that you just heard is, again, it's not fantasy, that data exists today. These are all pictures that I took on my mobile phone when I created this talk not long ago from data that was streaming in from various wearable devices that I was using at the time. And we'll talk about some of them in more detail, but there's a weight chart on the bottom left from Withings, there's a step chart on the bottom right from Fitbit, uh, etc. These again are all, and, and, it's, and the shot in the middle I believe is also, it's a dashboard view, I, I think that one's from Fitbit as well. The point is, between APIs and wearables, these things are all mashed up together now and you can show them on various apps on your phone, add in your dietary intake if you want, if you want to fill out a MyFitnessPal, etc. And that's all really Sam is doing in that last shot, is reminding me about how those things <coughs> could impact my near-term future. So, indeed, I get up, I have my uh, a breakfast according to what I was advised to do, I go to work, and like many of you, I spend most of my, my day in meetings, and so, at the end of the morning, I'm out for my 
uh, noontime walk after my meager lunch of hummus and chips, and I get another message from Sam. Hey Joe, me again, Sam. Have you thought about taking up swimming? I have a coupon from the Boston Sports Club just two blocks from the office. Six month membership, half price, and there's more. Turns out there are five other people in your online social network looking at this opportunity. I also see three time slots each week when you could meet at least one of them for a swim. Don't make up your mind right now. Think it over. Take a dip. So again, that's not a fantasy. All that stuff is available now. You all have experienced geofencing technology. You've gone into some store, like if you go in the Apple store now, they're happy to remind you, ask how they can help you while you enter the store. J. Crew does the same thing. These technologies are not fantasy. They are here. We just haven't put them together in a way that we can leverage them for better health. Now, the kicker in this little story, as I wind up my, my fantasy that's going to help you uh, set the tone for the meat of the talk is a message that comes in right after this, but this time from my daughter. Dad, I think swimming is a great idea for you. Thanks for skipping the cookie. You'll look great in your tux. <laughs> so she's on to me too. And again, this whole system is designed to keep my loved ones informed, to keep everyone informed about how I'm doing so I can meet my health goals. So this is a near-term future. Again, it's here today, as William Gibson is one of my favorite folks to quote, who said, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed, right? So that, all those things are here, and, and, and it's automated. So SAM is not a person. SAM is a software program. Uh, it's contextual. You saw how contextual it knows where I'm walking. It knows where my office is in relationship to the gym. It knows all my wearables data. So very, very strong context. Uh, motivational because it knows I want to look good for my daughter's wedding. Empowering, giving me all kinds of ways to achieve that goal and then very much involved with various incentives. As I said, Partners has given me the opportunity. I, I could have chose not to do this. I would have had to pay a slightly higher healthcare premium if I chose it. So my point in all that is the story is not that fictitious. It's not that far off. But you would all agree we're not there today. We're not there today, so how do we get there? And that's what I want to spend the rest of my few minutes with you talking about. And it has to do, I think, with really three areas of innovation, which are shown here. Uh, and they're data integration and the sensor side. These are the healthy things that we're talking about. All of those Internet of Things data that are streaming in. There's some work to do there. Uh, having all the data streams come in is not good enough, and I'll say more about that very, very shortly. Then there's the analytics side, the big data side, and I know there's big data companies and big data people here, so I'm sure we can have a rousing debate on how we can make the big data side, the analytics side, better to achieve this goal. And then finally, I would argue from my uh, perspective as a healthcare provider, who's worked in this area for many years, that if we know everything about you and can make you a, a, a unique persona of you, but we cannot engage with you, then it's really all lost. So how do we leverage all the psychologies that we know about to therefore engage you? So that's the framework. So again, the first part is about data aggregation and normalization. And what do I mean by that? Well, I showed you pictures earlier of my Withings weight scale, my Fitbit data. I didn't have my Fitness Pal data because I'm too impatient to fill it out, but I could have. And with those three data streams, my calories in, accurately taken in by my Fitness Pal, my calories out from Fitbit, and my weight, they should tell a story, right? We would all agree that they should tell some sort of story. But as you all know, if you now put them together in any one of these wonderful mobile screens, they just are three numbers. They don't tell me a story at all. One can go up one day and it doesn't explain why the others didn't go up or go down. That's normalization. That's normalization. If we're going to use this information clinically, we have to get much better at that. And I believe that there are opportunities for smart people who understand how software works 
to start to make those numbers make more sense in context. There's a couple of examples now of sensors that are coming out that start to do that at the individual wearable level. Muse is one of them. Muse is a head-worn device, so it's a, it's a wee bit awkward from a wearability perspective. What's interesting about it, and I had a picture of my Muse data on the top left uh, when I showed all those screens, Muse uh, takes in your EEG, which is, unless you're a neurologist, incredibly boring, but it reports out calm and stress. And it's used in a way for biofeedback and mindfulness meditation right now. There are many other uses as well. It's an example of a new breed of wearables that you'll be seeing that are reporting on things that are uh, contextual and meaningful as opposed to numbers the way Fitbit does. So Spire reports, again, calm and stress based on your respiratory rate. Uh, Empatica is a local startup that's reporting out when and, and, and alerting people when someone with epilepsy might have a grand mal seizure. And, and, and there are a number of others in that same category. So the sensor market is really interesting. And of course, sensors are becoming ingestible as well. Proteus Digital Health is a really amazing firm that's been now in existence for about 10 years. And they're finally getting to the point where you will see their stuff in the marketplace. Each one of those little pills has a radio in it when you swallow the pill, the radio activates because of the H cell in your stomach and communicates with a patch you also see pictured on the bottom left that you wear, and it's real-time adherence. It's not pharmacy data adherence. It's, uh, it's not taking a pill ball cap off of a smart pill ball. It's real-time ingestible adherence. This stuff is coming into the market in some of the common generics in the near future, blood pressure pills, uh, cholesterol pills, etc. So look forward to seeing that and what it's going to do for us in terms, again, of this enormous amount of data coming from these things in the internet of healthy things. Now on the analytics side, well, there's a lot of attention and it's pretty exciting, right, what's going on with big data and analytics, but this is kind of the state of the art. Uh, and these are two quotes from, from the book. Uh, one says something like, well, if we know that your family members are calling for more services, you might be headed for a bad outcome. Yeah, all right, I, I, I can see that, but is that really the best we can do? And the other one even, I think, is a little more uh, uh, Cute. It says, well, the, the magazines you read, whether you read Runner's Daily or Barbecue Daily, tell us a lot about you. Again, I'm sure it does, but we're going to have to do a whole lot better than that if we're going to get to use this in healthcare delivery. It's one thing for Netflix to tell me about a movie that I might like that I can snicker at because they got it wrong. But if I recommend, as Sam did, a healthy behavior to you, automatically and it's something that is completely off base, you won't come back because it's your health care. So the bottom line with analytics is we're in the stage where we get to say, say things like a hundred people like Ethan like something, therefore Ethan might like it. We have to get it down to the individual level. So rather than do it that way, it has to be individualized. And I think we can, and again, I think the things in the Internet of Things are going to help us do that because the richness of the data about each one of us will allow these software algorithms to pinpoint us individually based on things that are much finer detail than the movies we bought or the books that we bought. So that needs to be done. I'm sure it will be done. It's another innovation opportunity. And then finally, engagement. Uh, I wish I could talk more about engagement. It's one of my favorite areas. It's really what we spend most of our research and development time at uh, Partners Connected Health on because we're so passionate about understanding how to engage people. And there is a chapter uh, in, in my book on this, a whole chapter on, on several strategies and tactics for improving patient engagement. One uh, example in my little uh, ditty about Sam was the fact that he zeroed in on the fact that I wanted to look good for my daughter's wedding rather than lecture me about how I might have a heart attack or stroke 10 years down the line if I didn't get my, my health together. That's a really important bit of engagement. A couple of companies that are doing a good job in that space, Omada is one of them. I'm sure you've all heard about Omada by now, but they've done amazing work with a diabetes prevention program and uh, really just using wireless sensors and online coaching enabled a group of 
people who don't yet have a disease, and again, those of you who work in healthcare know how hard it is to get people who aren't yet sick to pay attention to that they might get sick, so pre-diabetes to get them to improve and be less at risk for that condition. Very impressive work from Omana. And then the other one I like to talk about is Welldoc, which is another fascinating firm, also in diabetes, it turns out, uh, I'm not obsessed with diabetes, but these are two good examples. And these, these guys started back in the day when we had flip phones and text messages were on those little screens, right? And an endocrinologist who founded them had this brilliant idea that she felt like she could engage better with her patients by engaging with them over their mobile device. And they've built it in every step along the way. They've been ahead of the market. They've got FDA approval before everyone did. They've gotten insurers to pay for it before everyone did. So they've done a fabulous job. And they would not have any of that success if they weren't able to engage the patients because that's what leads to the improved outcomes. Now, there's a lot left to do in engagement. So the first area of innovation and engagement is consumer-centric design. Most of what we see in healthcare that's designed is designed poorly. If, uh, if you're in the design space, we need you. Uh, if you're in a company that designs software, you need better design people. It's all designed very, very poorly, in, in my humble opinion. Uh, I mentioned fitting into everyday life. Let's start to take it less medical, more about your life. There's all kinds of good examples about that uh, in the book. Personalization is important, and I mentioned that earlier. But the idea that Sam was so focused on me and my life and my needs helps me keep engaged with the program so that I'll do, we'll, we'll be able to get into the size 40 waist. That's two inches off my waist, by the way. And then finally, the sentinel effect. And if I had more time, I'd spend more time on this as well. But this is something that I like to f point out because as healthcare providers in this new world, it's a bit of a digression, but as healthcare providers, we're now competing not with each other, but we're competing with CVS and Walgreens and, and, and Blue Cross offering their own programs, and it's, it's a really interesting world that's very consumer focused. The one thing we have is most people both feel like they have a good relationship with their doctor and don't want to disappoint their doctor. And a lot of the programs we've set up at Partners Connected Health have leveraged this idea that Someone from your doctor's office is watching your data and will check in with you from time to time. And patients tell us that's incredibly motivating to keep on the straight and narrow. So the Sentinel effect is a really interesting design principle to work into these programs. So that is a very quick flyby. I'm going to take you back to the future, the end of that long day that I described. This time the, the message that comes through is from my doctor, though, not from Sam. Good evening, Joe. Time for the end of the day wrap up. We know that Sam's been pretty tough on you. We've been monitoring all day, but all in all, you're doing pretty well. We think the suggestion of swimming is a good one, and you can use more sleep. Why don't you spend some time over the next few days thinking about which you want to work on first? Your record shows that if you try to do both, you'll fail at both. But if you focus on one, your history predicts you'll succeed. On that note, good night. Have a great night's sleep. Well, thanks very much. So these are my credentials and uh, uh, some of the other writing I do, blogging and so forth. And I think we're going to transition now into a panel. But if uh, it's up to my, the organizers, we can take questions or go directly to the panel. It's, it's really your call. I'm at the end of my time, so I want to be respectful of the clock. No? Panel? All right. Let me invite my panelists up then. And they are Richard, uh, sorry, Brian Richard. Is Brian here? Hopefully. Yes. No? Maybe. There he is. Come on up, Brian. Brian's the CIO from uh, Masonic Care. He's going to tell you more about that in a moment. And uh, Rob, uh, Bob Zemke. Is Bob here? He's coming as well. Good. Two out of three. I'm, I'm in good shape. And then Matt Fisher. That's here as well. All right, guys, please have a seat and we'll get rolling on the panel. So we're going to do a panel uh, on uh, the power of mobile. So again, following, I think, really following the um, theme from the keynote and then 
following on in the theme of the day about innovation, uh, it seems